I'm going to introduce Rami and then they will take it from there. Uh, Rami George is an interdisciplinary artist currently based on Lenape land in what is now called Philadelphia. Their work spanning photo, video, installation, text, and recently music and sound has been presented in exhibitions and screenings at the William Way LGBT Community Center, Philadelphia, MIT List Visual Arts Center in Cambridge, Anthology Film Archives in New York, Center for Contemporary Arts in Glasgow, Grand Union in Birmingham, the Institute for Contemporary Arts in London, the Institute for Contempor of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, Lux in London, and the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and many other places. They continue to be influenced and motivated by political structures and fractured narratives. Rami's latest project, And Into the Streets, is currently on view, a public art project at Lewis Kahn Park, funded by Mural Arts Philadelphia, and it's running through August. Um, and I think Rami will talk a little bit more about that today, but um, welcome Rami. Great, thank you. Thank you, Lori, um, for the inv invitation to all that are here. Um, <clears throat> it's gonna be, I'm gonna chat for, I, I think like 45 minutes or something like that, and then we'll have time for Q and A. But also if you have questions and you wanna put, throw them in the chat, Either we can save them there, or if they pertain, I'll, I'll jump in or something like that if I see them. So feel free to chime in as we go, um, or save your questions for the end, whichever you prefer. Um, so yeah, as Lori mentioned, I am here based in Philadelphia. I've been here six years, and um, I've been really appreciating sinking into what it means to be a Philadelphia-based artist. Um, and part of that has been really enjoying um, digging deep into the archives at the Willing Way LGBT Community Center. And those are called the John J. Wilcox Jr. Archives. Um, they're on the third floor of the center. They're open to the public. And part of my work there has been also um, with the idea of sharing things so that other people can also go and explore on their own. And I'll talk about that as well. So I figured I will share my screen. Um, I'm going to walk us through um, a lot of kind of snapshots and things that I was taking um, along the way, along my explorations. I'll also show you, I'll introduce actually, um, my first project in the archives was back in 2019 when I was still a graduate student. So I'll talk about what that was and how I worked in the archives there. And then mostly I'm going to talk about uh, my current work, um, which um, culminated in an exhibition at the center called Selections from the Archives. That was in January and February. And then now currently has um, extended into a new iteration called And Into the Streets, which is a collaboration with Mural Arts and it's in Louis Kahn Park. So a very public version. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen and I will take us from there. And let me see, just me, great. Okay, and I'll try and keep track of time too, but um, feel free to give me a notice or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, this talk is called Selections from the um, Philadelphia Archives or something to that extent from the LGBT Archives. Um, and really, Lori had approached me and asked if I wanted to share about my ongoing research in the archives, particularly with my um, former presentation at the center, which was called Selections from the Archives. So this is um, the poster that we designed for that exhibition. I'm just going to look at the chat real quick. Great. Um, and this is in collaboration with M. Slater, who is a local designer who also works at the archives, local um, rad queer trans artist. Um, and M has helped me design a lot of things throughout my practice, um, this being one of them. So this was the takeaway for the exhibition. These were free posters. I actually printed some more. So if they're interesting to you, we can chat about how you might be able to get one. Um, and this does represent a lot of how I was working inside the archives, which mostly for the, these projects, I was really looking for images or found um, photos and um, content like that. 
Um, I also was specifically um, wanting to search for underrepresented folks. So the archives acknowledge that they do a great job of recording cis gay white history, and they're working to fill in their gaps. Um, but with that knowledge, I know that also um, folks of difference have, are always present and always around. And so I was also doing some of that work to search for them. Okay. So I'm gonna um, take us back a little bit to my first forays into the archives. Um, when I got to Philadelphia, I was in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and for my final project, I was interested in some of these historical markers that exist around Philadelphia. Um, you've, I'm sure you've seen them, blue and gold, really kind of bad graphic design, I think. Um, but when I moved here, I saw that there was a hand, there were a handful that were for LGBT rights. My cat may join me at some point. Um, and I was interested in these um, markers, both um, that they were things I did not know about, and also kind of the inadequacy of something like this. Um, it's kind of like a tweet, it's a um, reduced amount of text. Um, and I'm, I was curious about what they marked and who they did not mark. And I think that my cat maybe will go away now. Um, so this was the first one I saw, which is for the gay rights demonstrations, um, which were annual public demonstrations for gay and lesbian equality held at Independence Hall. Um, and we'll see that those return. There also are a handful of others, including for Barbara Giddings, um, known as the mother of the LGBT civil rights movement. Um, Giddings was a super active lesbian and activist in Philadelphia and New York, um, and you'll see makes her appearance in my practice as well. This was the my exhibition, my MFA exhibition. Um, it was called Brotherly Love, Sisterly Affection. So the nicknames of Philadelphia, but I also think that if we want, they can be nice and sexy and queer um, names too. Um, and for this project, I was really exploring kind of some sculptural tendencies or pushing those and also thinking through those historical markers and the archives and language and history and all those sorts of things. Um, in my work, I'm very often am gravitating towards like everyday materials or everyday photos. So including kind of like construction materials, if I'm working um, sculpturally, things you could find at a um, home goods store, as opposed to things that are explicitly at a fine arts store. Um, and so here I was um, thinking about those language markers and I was finding different markers to take note of. So these are from different figures that I found within the archives. Um, some of these figures I was re kind of examining the historical markers, who they picked, what were their stories beyond the language they chose. And other times I was finding new folks. So one of those new folks for me was the person Susan Edith Sachs who was the first woman to be on the FBI's most wanted list. And she was um, wanted in connection to a bank heist that turned into, um, the, or involved the death of um, bank tellers. And this was a heist for funding civil rights, like an anti-racist activism. When she was arrested in Philadelphia, she spoke this at her public statement. The love I share of my sisters is a far more formidable weapon than the police state can bring against us. Keep growing, keep strong. I am a free woman and I can keep strong. Pass the word, I am unafraid. So I was interested too in those first word, like spoken things. Likewise here, this is um, language from an anti-war, anti-Vietnam protest done by Kiyoshi Kuromiya, who was another local activist um, who also reappears a lot in the practice. Um, over here is something around the Dewey sit-in, which is a whole nother story. Um, when I was in the archives for this first time too, I also found a whole bunch of other folks that I thought were really interesting. Um, and those included people like Donna Mae Stemmer, who I think you can see my mouse is here. This is a slideshow of um, scanned photos of hers um, projected up from a mini projector. And um, Donna May was a local trans woman and gay softball um, cheerleader and fashion icon, um, ex-military. Um, and when she passed, 
Her materials luckily were saved, and that included thousands of self-portraits of herself documenting herself, um, and her different looks, her different moods inside of her domestic space inside her home. Um, really rich treasure trove that I really gravitated towards. Um, and you'll see that Donna May comes back in the work too. This is also, I'm, I'm into reproducing um, found ephemera. And so this is a poster originally produced by Kiyoshi Kuromiya, someone an act activist I had just recently mentioned. Um, so he produced this poster. It is, says, fuck the draft in large font. Um, and it is someone burning their draft card. Um, he was arrested multiple times. I reproduced this on a risograph and on the back is the first page of Kiyoshi's FBI file. And I was interested in the recirculation of this. Um, this image also reminds me that there um, is language and content in here that may not be for everyone, including kind of sexual and I don't know, other things. So just a sort of heads up around that. Nothing too explicit, I double checked, but just if you're warned, if you're worried about that. Okay, so that was the first time I was in the archives. Um, then I, since I settled into Philadelphia, settled into being a working artist here. I also now teach at the University of Pennsylvania. And I knew that I wanted to spend a lot more time in the archives. I felt like that first project was really just starting to get a taste of what the archives are and what they provide. And I wanted to spend a whole lot more time and do a, a bigger project or just continue the work. Something that's beautiful about the LGBT Center is that they accept proposals for their exhibitions. And their exhibitions happen in their lobby space. So it is both lobby, it is multi-use center, people are coming in for all sorts of variety of services, um, therapy, group activities, yoga for elders, all different things. Um, and it also is where they have their public art or their art space. Um, what I was interested in that the possibility of this opportunity is exhibiting for the first time in a non specifically art context. It's a multi use center, it both is art, but it also is all sorts of folks coming through. Um, and I proposed a project to use the whole of the space. There is kind of technically two galleries, there's one reserved for archive shows and there's one reserved for other projects. Um, I was like, I want to do an archive show that takes over everything. This is my proposal to them um, in the email. It's just, I want to, I said selections from the archive, working title. You'll see it really became the title and described so much of it. And I just talked about how I wanted to go inside. I wanted to sit with these histories and stories. I want to provide a poetic reinterpretation of them. And I also really wanted to look for those folks less represented. So queer, trans, non-binary, lesbian. And to add to this, I was also looking for folks of color and disabled folks and all sorts of individuals. Um, I will say too that I, I wasn't explicitly looking for the gay male experience, knowing that that's already so kind of well presented in many capacities, but you'll see that there were certain stories that uh, were really moving and um, within that category that I did also include. Um, they wrote me back, they were very excited about the project, and then it was set in place that I could then start the deep dive and then eventually um, present this work. So I'm going to just show you a whole bunch of my photos from um, to start and then the, what happened in the project. And so the archives um, were also off site for a couple years during the pandemic. Um, and I was kind of itching to get into the materials. And so the first spot that I was able to go was actually in their Spirit of the Leopard Room, which is where they keep their art collection. So like paintings, photography, things like that. And then also just surplus kind of like ephemera content, um, some big signs and things like that. So while the most of the materials were off site as they were remodeling, this room still held a bunch of stuff. And so this is where I started. And when I was going into the archives, I knew that I wanted to look for those folks that I had mentioned. I also knew that I wanted to um, take inspiration from kind of like everyday modes of presentation. So how people present photos um, and collages and scrapbooks and things like that without necessarily a kind of fine art um, like focus or mind. Instead, it's 
you know, done from a different space. And I'm really inspired by those types of things. So here's one such um, poster that I found. Um, I was also finding things. Um, I ended up finding a lot about the history of the community center um, and, and its different lives and iterations. And you'll see that that also makes its way into the exhibition as well. Um, I also love how things are kind of um, not, or I mean, it's slipped inside this frame. The frame's a little bit too big, but I, again, I like those aesthetic sort of like differences. Here's an original sign from Daughters of Elitis Philadelphia, which was a lesbian organization and group, activist group. And you'll see this makes its way again in the project. Just kind of like what I um, saw as an amazing found photo collage, assemblage. Um, and so something too, you'll see that for a while I was thinking I would go and find these examples, take them as inspiration for my own making. But after a certain point, I was like, the art's already done for me. So maybe I play a different role. Maybe I think about what is this like curator artist kind of like capacity. Um, I also was finding a lot about actually William Way. So the center is named the William Way LGBT Community Center, named after Bill Way, um, who was a um, local, um, he worked in the housing administration in Philadelphia, had a pretty big um, role. And then he also was um, helping to run the community center, particularly when they were called Penguin Place, community center without walls. That's also another part of the story that I'm really interested in. But the, the center's named after Bill because he was hosting the center when it didn't have a space on his living room floor. Um, and that is just around the corner. It's above where PGN used to be. This is, um, I say that now because this is material from Bill Way's images. Um, so a, a, to me, a beautiful collage um, from Bill Way. I was also just finding kind of like, um, again, this is how these materials are stored in the archives. So finding these bundles of protest signages, but just being really kind of moved by them as sculptural forms and objects. I had a conversation later with John Andres, who's the amazing director of the archives, and this has really allowed me to take a lot of kind of um, privileges and liberty as an artist. Um, and for John, he talked about how, like, he's like, this is not how we should preserve this material. Like, I'm showing them warts and all and sort of bringing it downstairs, which eventually I did. But for me, again, I understand that necessity of preservation, but I also love how in flux and rich this community center is. And it's a, a space, it's a site, it's active, it's in use. It is for the community. Um, I don't, there's no white gloves. There's no things behind glass. There's obviously precautions you take to hold things and manage things um, properly, but it's living and breathing, which I also really appreciate. And again, as someone who's really drawn to photos, I was really kind of looking for the images. There's a lot of other documents and materials inside the archives, including kind of the um, like legal sort of ephemera around organizations, um, all publications from certain groups, things like that. What I love is just the snapshots. And so I was finding these really beautiful things and finding also these, what I find beautiful presentations of them taking inspiration from that. Here's Donna Mae Stemmer um, with Bill Goldberg. This was a new collection that I'm still um, eager to dive deep into. But again, it was lovely already to find, to see these people that I'd started to learn about in my first project reappear in multiple capacities. Um, folks that have passed before my time or before I you know, was able to meet them, but feel like I'm getting parts of their stories and narratives through the archives. I was also going around um, as the material came back to the center and be like, okay, that's a spot I need to go explore more. So small photos collections, anything that sort of led to photos, I would take a picture of and then I'd return to it. Um, it all came back plastic wrap from the move. I got to unwrap it and dig in. Um, and then I also decided to go through every single pre periodical produced or publication magazine. Um, and I was doing this to, again, look for those less represented folks in these spaces. I thought I would take these photos as sort of reference images and then come back and do some higher res scans and play with them in different capacities. But you'll see this turned into something else down the line. 
This is something I found early on. These photos are actually in the order that I found them as I was moving through. But this is um, on the back of a um, magazine or journal called Transistors, the Journal of Transsexual Feminism. And this what I found was this beautiful call to action list around um, support and um, for trans and non-binary folks. So um, beautiful things in here like um, watch the police on the transsexual prostitute stroll, educate the people who answer the local hot signs about transsexuals, look critically at how we treat each other. Um, down the line, I love this trans start a transsexual coven, do transsexual magic, um, organize a transsexual poetry reading. You'll see that comes up later. Um, and then the last, um, add new ideas to this list, distribute it, laugh, cry, love. I also love this um, idea of things not being set in stone. And that's also part of my interest in the archives. Um, time is circular or a spiral. Things have new resonances. Um, we can revisit, revise, re-say, or just learn. You'll see my body limbs just kind of like all over. I really was like in the archives. Um, also finding these beautiful photos. Um, problem is dead soldiers, not gay soldiers, ban the military. Again, not everyone's politics, but they are mine. Um, this is from a Quaker protest. And finding, yeah, these like resources that um, whether the language was present or not, people have been non-binary, trans, all these sorts of things forever. Um, and there's been different if we kind of like look um, through the materials, we can find different examples of that. And again, maybe it's not exactly how we identify it now or the language we use, but I was curious about those things. Sexy photos too. The archives are both kind of like hard, difficult, emotional, intense, and they're also really erotic, um, which is, I find great. Again, these beautiful photos. Um, Sometimes the material is um, sorted by the archives and sometimes it's less. So it depends on kind of how far they are in their process. So these are um, someone's collections and they're all inside of these sleeves, but other times they're just loose photos that I kind of rifle through. Again, Donna May, Nasty Girl. I slept with Monica too, some great um, moments. Um, this is, I, what I also stumbled upon was Bill Way's scrapbooks. So they are also inside the archives. Um, and this was an example of how um, I wasn't looking for gay, cis, cis gay white male history, but then I found Bill Way's scrapbooks and it was something really interesting for me of, to kind of uncover or unpack like, who is William Way? Why is the community that are named that way or named for that? So often I, we go into these spaces and they're named after folks that no longer are with us, mostly because they were rich um, and they paid some money. Um, but I'm always curious about like who those people were. And so it was really kind of, or really was incredible to spend a day with Bill. Um, these scrapbooks go from his birth until his premature death from AIDS related complications. And it was so incredibly moving to learn about this person's life through their own making and their own story and their own aesthetic. And so there's all these tender moments, um, beautiful like kind of abstract collages or I consider abstract collages, they're not, they're just beautiful collages. Um, community folks, penguins make a strong appearance in all of this work. And again, the, for a time, the LGBT center was named Penguin Place, Community Center Without Walls. And the story behind that is that um, there was this moment in civil rights um, and gay liberation where they were trying to meet each other, but also some folks not being into that. And a black civil rights um, leader in DC was like, I don't get all this gay rights stuff, what's next, penguin rights? So Philadelphia um, queers you know, took that up and made Navy Penguin Place. And then there was also, it was really intense and emotional you know, um, finding the pages where he talks about his diagnosis with AIDS and then folks coming to visit him, um, get well cards, and then there's like 32 blank pages. And that, you know, still, I made a video around this and it still makes me really emotional. Also looking for, again, um, like content, 
from other perspectives, so lesbian periodicals, POC magazines. I'm gonna go a little bit faster because we got, I know I have time. Um, finding these examples of past flyers that were super inspiring, Tommy Abicola Mecca, so poetry at the center. And then just beautiful individuals and photos. And again, I'm finding these all as just singular images or material, not necessarily knowing who they are or, or finding out where the stories are. Um, here's a whole bunch of names for used against or for um, queerness, early trans magazines. Sorry. Um, finding recently they got donated these scrapbooks from the Mox Nix group, which was a Black LGBT um, kind of elite um, social club, um, and some really incredible photos in there. And then back to my original interest of those historical markers, like finding these beautiful intergenerational moments, elders that were present that were then celebrating the signs. Here again, too, this is Kayla Husin, um, former partner of Barbara Giddings. Um, and there's that sign that was in the archives. And so all of those little connections became really interesting and fruitful for me. More just beautiful individuals unnamed. Found collages. I was just like, the art's already made. I can take inspiration or I can just rescan it and represent it. And then I was also led by John to um, learn about the work of Roberta Dickinson, who was a local artist, activist, um, architect, um, who transitioned and documented her transition in watercolors. And then also this beautiful photo collage, self-portrait, some of her work. more just kind of beautiful images. Here's Barbara Giddings, I love this one. Unnamed folks for me, but beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna jump over to the web version of this because we actually did a, like a lot of work to make this a uh, living archive and platform. So this is the um, representation of selections from the archives, the exhibition in um, digital form. And I will take us there. Okay, so here, and this is available to everyone. I can drop in the link as well, wege.org slash selections forward slash. And so this is selections from the archives, Rami George, alongside Roberta Dickinson and exhibition. So this is my work for the center in January, February from all of that initial research. Everything is selections from the archives, but I wanted to give Roberta <clears throat> her own solo show. You'll see, or she had a solo show at the center back um, in the day. And I felt like it was a great way to um, give that another opportunity. <clears throat> so if you go online, you can scroll through, we've designated or we've organized it by these sections, one, two, three, and four. Um, and this is how I presented the work. It was a whole bunch of little fragments, reproduced ephemera, original ephemera in frames, original bundles just brought downstairs with material. This is the only photo that I took. You'll see that, or actually there's a lot of photos in the slideshow, but most of the time it's I'm using a scanner and reproducing material. And in this, I really am trying to make those free associations. So materials that were not ever kind of next to each other, placing them next to each other and seeing what happens it, to it. Sometimes they're little bundles from the same collection. So this is all from Tommy Alvicola Mecca's collection, who was a really important local figure. Um, and I also wanted to use this time to mark individuals and collections so that other people could do even more work. Something I was finding is that I could look forever and I needed to make a take a pause and actually just decide what goes downstairs. But I wanted to have other people be able to go back upstairs and find more. So again, some my own collages reproduced, enlarged, reproduced one to one, that original photo. I have a video of the Billway scrapbooks. I made more penguin place buttons. I reproduced those to give away. Um, big photos from the Au Courant collection, which I'll chat more about, and Roberta Dickinson, an exhibition. So I'll just go through these a little bit. Here's the first, first little nook, all these things. So all those photos that I was showing you in the beginning, um, just looking through the boxes, I ended up making those into a slideshow. 
And I think about this as a visual finding aid. So I didn't go back in and rescan the materials. I was like, I can just have these as photos from my cell phone, have it be on loop on this iPad. And what I think about this is the archives have these finding aids, they're textual. They'll say, this is what the materials are inside of these collections, these sorts of details they have. For me as a visual person, it doesn't always help me. And so I was, um, I thought that this could be a way to say, okay, here's all these things. There's a way for you to go back and find them. All of these materials are alphabetized by their title. So if you're looking for Dyke Magazine that I just presented to you, you just go to the box with D. Or actually you ask John to go to the box with D and he'll bring it to you. Um, reproduced a large, that poster or the back of it becoming a poster. Beautiful little photos from Tommy. Um, community, friendship, networks, the AIDS crisis becomes a really strong component of the work um, just by how present it is in, in our history and our shared queer history and how much is present in the archives. And again, sort of like these connections between things that maybe never once were connected, beautiful individuals. Okay, and in here, I'll just show you, there's also an audio piece with John Cunningham. I won't play that for sake of time, but this is an elder who was involved with the center, who knew Bill Way, but was um, involved with the center. We talk about Bill, we talk about the center, we talk about Philadelphia, we talk about AIDS. Um, it's both funny and moving and makes me cry, we cry. Um, and that was meant as something that you could listen to and meander through the whole space. Here is um, the snippet of that slideshow. And again, it's called Visual Finding Aid, Periodicals, Ephemera, and Clippings. And these are all material from those different sections. And so it is uh, 14 minutes. I think each image is four seconds. They're placed in the order that I found them. And again, I think about this as someone can look through this and be like, OK, I really am interested in that the latter. And so now they have a visual reference and they can go and find it. Um, so it is these publications. There's also just beautiful design that I was kind of um, interested in. Um, I tried to keep this more for um, those searching things that I was looking for. And then also these clippings um, that are quite incredible. Something too on this website is that we made um, links to all the um, finding aids from the center. So if for any project, this was visual finding aids, here's the periodicals collection, um, finding aid from the center, ephemera files, clipping files. So I wanted to have it be kind of a container within a container, an archive within the archives. And so that this also can live on and people can go and find these materials in any way that they want. Little corner two, more photos and collages from Woody's bar photos from the AIDS quilt or the names project. That photo that was struck to me, Donna May and other folks that I don't know the names of yet, would love to know. Kiyoshi Kuromiya in the archives. That photo, I just had John get some plexiglass and so we framed it and brought it downstairs. And then this is a video of the Billway scrapbooks, um, Penguin Place Buttons and Miscellaneous Ephemera. And I'll show you really quickly just a little bit of that video. I gotta move my face. So here is Billway scrapbooks, the last three 32 blank pages. So in this video, I was really interested in getting to know Bill, but also getting to know then the history of the center, the history of Philadelphia of a time of a generation, um, through the lens of this single individual. And I just went through, that's actually Kiyoshi Kiramiya. People keep reappearing because it's community. Um, I went through and I filmed the, page, the pages that kind of stood out to me. So there's mundane things like health and parties. Um, Bill loves um, to party and he loved the mummers. And so that's also a big part of it. Um, history of Philadelphia that I don't yet know about. Um, and then um, his partner moving, coming back. There's little hints of myself in this, like my shirt appears, things like that. Um, and then there's these moments where we kind of get, um, we get ideas about what's to come. So um, really sick in, I think this last one was really sick in June, um, community center, like consultants hired, like all these hints about the up in like upcoming crisis. 
Um, he also talks about when AIDS is first announced. Um, and then these books were became the most interesting to me because they also were when the, he was most involved with the community center or only involved with the community center. So these are all those images from uh, Penguin Place, from his house, doing the work, organizing volunteers, sending out things, going to protests, still having fun and partying, and then his diagnosis um, from AIDS-related or AIDS. And eventually, people are going to visit him. There are these get well cards. And um, then there are 32 blank pages, which was the most sort of like um, emotional part for me. So that the final performance is five minutes of just turning these blank pages. Um, for me, around like it hits in ways of like life that could have been lived. And, you know, not just for Bill, but for so many folks. Um, the, this is from the Ocurrant collection. And so that's what this um, new project is about in which I will get to shortly. Ocurrant was an LGBT um, bi-weekly, I think, um, periodical. Um, covered news, local, local news, celebrity things, music, all these sorts of stuff. Um, when they closed in 2000, I think their archives have their materials from 82 to 2000. Um, they donated their materials to the archives, including just thousands and thousands and thousands of loose snapshots. So photos that were used for the newspaper, but so many of them were not, because of course you take a roll of film and maybe you use one photo for the newspaper, if that. And I was really interested in all of these extra photos, including all the like mistakes. So light leaks, um, double exposures, um, all sorts of things like that. For, I've worked now with this material a few times. For this iteration, I presented them on these big um, five feet by six feet prints, and they're presented in the order I found them. So this is box, um, let's see, 28 um, is boxes 15 to 21. So this is box 15, line break box 16, line break 17. And so again, thinking about the ways that other folks could come in and be like, oh, I'm really interested in that photo. You could literally go find it and say, okay, it's in that box. These materials are unsorted. And what I like about that too, um, unsorted by the archives, is that time is really slippery and things come in and out and people reappear and it's not linear, which I also am really interested in as an artist. And again, you can view larger and kind of dig deeper and you can go to those materials. Last little thing on the website, Roberta Dickinson's room. So I selected, I curated Roberta Dickinson's second solo show at the archives. And so I included um, her watercolors and a couple line drawings, some sketches. Um, and I loved that Roberta had an exhibition at the center. I found this ephemera there describing that. This was her poster. And so we wanted to give, or I wanted to give her another show. I loved Roberta Dickinson and Exhibition. So that's what her second solo show at the center is called. And it is just, it's still selections in the archive, but it's Roberta's own room. Beautiful, amazing watercolors documenting her transition. And then the last thing up on here, we scroll to the bottom, we have our info, we have folks named. I luckily got a Leeway Foundation Art and Change grant, which was supported this project. And you can also download these posters. Um, we made a risograph reproduction or like a revisiting of Roberta Dickinson's. So she has her own poster for the show and we have that original poster. Okay, I will go back to the slideshow and I'm gonna race through the last little bit. Last couple things, this is the work as it was presented, the current work um, in the show. And then I also did some public programming. So I did a slideshow performance with the Okrant materials using all of them. And Savan De Paul, a local QT BIPOC musician, did a live score. And then we closed the event with a poetry reading. And so this, if you remember way back when, this is really referencing a Tommy Abicola Mecca poster flyer. Um, and so this was an intergenerational trans and non-binary poetry reading um, organized by myself, um, folks that I know, and in the lobby of the center, um, five different artists, writers, poets who presented their work and those the close. Um, it was a beautiful, amazing turnout, um, more than we had expected, and we just took over the whole lobby. Um, I also love this moment of someone on someone's shoulders to get up high to see some of these closer photos from the Ocaron collection. There's so many beautiful images. Okay. 
So last, to just give you a little teaser, this is the current body of work. So with that last exhibition, I had been having conversations with Jamison Page, who works at Mural Arts. I originally, I was like, what if we did a billboard to coincide with this show? It didn't work out, but then Jamison invited me to think through a whole new iteration, a public park version. And so for this, um, I was thinking about what does it mean to take this material out of the archives and into the streets? Um, and what do I, how do I wanna work in this, my most public presentation yet? Um, prior to that, the William Way lobby was the most public space I've exhibited in many ways. And now this is a public park. So it is any number of folks, people that are there for art or not. Most people are, are there not for the art. Um, and I want to think through that. So for this, I also really dug deeper into the Au Courant collection. I just really wanted to focus with that bundle. So many incredible images. It tells a portrait of Philadelphia. It tells a portrait of a time, 83 to 2000. It continues where Bill Way's scrapbooks leave off with the early um, mark of the AIDS crisis. And there's a lot of activism. There's a lot of ACT UP. There's a lot of protest. There's also a lot of pride. There's a lot of celebration, intimacy public displays, actions, um, ephemera. So I went back into the archives and I really um, was focusing purely on Au Courant. I was scanning some of their papers, initial things, finding ephemera like their contact sheets um, and really focusing on how do I bring Au Courant out into the public and thinking about this again as that portrait of Philadelphia. This is also up, we installed it in June. June is still now, we're almost done with June. But um, thinking about this being up during Pride. So there is a lot of Pride imagery. There's Pride celebrations. Um, but also thinking about what are the other necessities, particularly in this moment during this month or during every month. And so thinking about a lot of also call to action and protests and um, responsibility and support. Um, you'll see too, like I love vernacular structures. We borrow the, the template from the park. Hannah de Klerk is the fabricator. Um, they made my sh shelves for the original show, and then they made this huge um, version for this public project. So what this consists of, um, we have billboard-like structures in the banks uh, lining the um, park. On the um, verso or facing sort of like the street, we have these intuitive collages. And so this is also the was for me to be able to play a bit more um, loosely and associatively. And inside you'll see there's a different strategy. So before I was kind of, I was really interested in honoring the archive in the collections. And I still am interested in honoring the archive in the collections, but this has been fun to kind of get more of my interpretive spin to place again, those images that were, were not shot or made for the same context, but I think add something different um, in their presentation. And here is some more of these. Here's that 33 years of gay activist, but in the ephemera form, whole bunch of beautiful miscellaneous ephemera, some abstractions to transsexuals for change. We definitely, we uh, made sure to get anti-graffiti coded um, printing because we're in this moment that is so rife with anti-trans rhetoric and anti-LGBT rhetoric. Thus far, I been happy that no graffiti has happened and people have been really receptive to it. But of course, we have some um, folks coming to town soon um, and who knows what will happen. I just love these kind of calls to action in different capacities. Also these moments of text, wow, what a great shot. Like I agree, everything's a great shot. There's so many beautiful things, abstract. Here's the interior. So when you enter the park, there's a different sort of space and capacity. And this is more, again, kind of like the snapshots. So finding these photos and playing with them in different ways, different folks, known and unknown, Donna May, always with me, um, thinking about disability representation, pride, protest, all those folks that I was looking for that are so rich and in the card guys. Some amazing act up um, content as well. The um, most, for the most part, Mural Arts was amazing and supportive of my imagery, as well as the Friends of the Park who we were working with. They're um, a community in the neighborhood that support this park. There was one image that they were not so comfortable with. I replaced it with this one. It's a sign that someone holding up that says crucifixion is not for everyone, which I totally agree with. Um, and I was like, okay, I, 
can see how this one might be the most sort of like potentially challenging for folks, but I'm gonna bring that back somewhere. It's an important one. And then the interior of the park. So you, you see those, um, the backs of those um, boards, right? And then there are all these smaller structures that are a bit more maybe kind of like body or human size. And there's different treatments on these. So there's a couple moments where it's just colored plexiglass and images. Here's Kiyoshi, here's Barbara, here's um, John, who I the interview I eldered. Here's Tommy, Abikoli Mecca, found photos. Um, and so sometimes having images, singular things kind of to point out, um, triptychs, diptychs, different sizes, things like that, gaps in the frame. Um, up here it says gay dads showed off their pride in children. Um, thinking about too, what is what is kind of like child height or wheelchair height or people of different like heights height. Um, and so what, how can I make different viewing points? So maybe kind of images that are below that might be easier to, to kind of like digest and images up top that maybe need a little bit more kind of like time. On the verso of this, there's a more in, sort of like intense image. Not intense, but sort of around hits emotional. And then like beautiful dancing color. This is the original, it's, it's out of focus, but this is the original marker um, for the park. And so you can kind of see how we took inspiration from that. Um, and then I'll close on this, that we are having finally our um, opening reception and also another queer reading in the park. So we had planned to have a reception on June 7th, but the intense fires got in our way. And then we had moved it to that following Monday and then there was intense storms that got in our way. And tonight it's looking like everything is good to go. So we're gonna have our opening reception at long last and we're going to have um, readings by organized by Blue Stoop, which is a local amazing literary organization. And so poets and essayists and writers, David Acosta, um, Chris Malcolm Belk, Amy Coppola Eisenberg, Adia Seiler and Taylor Towns will read tonight with material of their own. But I just said, here is the prompt, here is the premise. Um, you can read something in relationship to it or your own, old or new, a, bit, a mix of both and however you want. We've also been partnering with other organizations. So um, Kiki Archives made two takeaway posters that will be available for free. And then Fortune, um, Kiki is focuses on like black diasporic um, queer and trans history. And Fortune, which is a local um, queer Asian collective that really focused on those things. They designed an amazing shirt, which I am wearing and I can represent. Uh, it's like my auto focus is working differently. But they were looking at these um, images, um, beautiful images from the um, Chinatown and from the Chinatown arc, which is called the Friendship Arc. Um, and they made this amazing poster or shirt that also talks about the current um, crisis in terms of proposed arena stadium and relating that to all these different moments when those things were also being brought to the fore. So the proceeds from these shirts, they're sliding scale, 20 to $60. They're available at the opening and at other future events. Proceeds help support the Shaved Safe Chinatown Coalition, RICE, um, and also the, go to the William Way Center. So buy one, I think they're lovely. They're limited edition as well. And now I will stop my sharing and would love to engage in conversations if you all want to do that. And okay. Stop sharing. Great. Okay, I'm back. Thank you, Rami. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I have some questions, but I, I actually want to see if anybody else has questions or maybe I should. Does anybody else have a question that they wanna drop in the chat or unmute themselves? Already, I, I mean, I love this. Oh, I got a direct message from court, so it's not public, but talking about going to the park, being really moved, living in NYC, experiencing all these things, I would love to connect and chat more. I think that's something that I'm really excited about this project is that folks that were around during these, these years um, experience it in a vast different way than I do. I'm coming at it like as just found amazing images and relating it to this current moment and struggle but knowing that there's something, you know, folks that were there experience it very different. Um, I, I 
I guess my curiosity, because I work also um, at times in archives and and um, thinking about process and I'm just wondering, first of all, about how much time you were like, how much you've been working on it since grad school, of course, but um, do you ever feel like you're getting um, overwhelmed? And then if so, how do you then help direct yourself or, you know, sort of get a hold and refine your direction when you're in such incredible richness? Yeah, it was something that I really navigated for selections from the archives because I was like, I just kept, I was in there so, so, so much. I wouldn't be in there like either like all day, like morning and afternoon or morning before I taught or afternoon after I was teaching. So I was just kind of in there as many hours as I could. And even I asked John, the director at one point, I was like, how many hours do you think I've been in here? And he was like, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't remember, I don't know how many hours. I basically became an honorary employee. And they also gave me that privilege that um, I was able to search and peruse in ways that um, other folks are not allowed to. Um, if you go to the archives, you generally say, I'm interested in this. I know that this is here. Can you bring it to me? And John will work with you to bring the materials. Because I've been working with them for so long, I'm able to just go and search and be delicate and gentle. And um, that's been so rich and it's led me to all these different things. But so then, yeah, for the selections from the archives, I had to be like, okay, there's an exhibition deadline. I need to pause. I have so much stuff already, more than I can fit into the exhibition. So now it's a time to think about like, what is most pressing? What makes most sense next to each other? I really, you know, want to make this into a publication or book at some point. Um, and that would open up different capacities. Um, and something that's been really exciting too is that um, they're gonna announce this soon. They haven't yet, and I hope it's okay that I share it. But John invited me to be the first artist in residence for the archives. So I am gonna have a lot of time to keep sitting inside there and to keep working. And I'm excited too to kind of, um, to play in different ways and to kind of um, do different opportunities, do different searching, maybe get a little bit messier and get a little less precious because there's something that is really wonderful about honoring and marking these collections. And now that I've done a lot of that work and always have some sort of way to get people back there, I'm like, what happens if I start to mess things up a little bit and make that time a little bit even more blurry? Um, yeah, because you can work in so many, I mean, your work, your work has stretched into so many spaces. Um, it's very exciting. Um, you know, uh, I know that the one piece that I saw was the piece at, um, at the icebox, um, of the s symbols and everything. And I, you just took mm -hmm. those symbols and kind of opened things up for a whole bunch of people. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? I always feel like I ask too many questions. You can put them in the chat and we'll read them as well. Let's see, nothing, nothing yet. Mm -hmm. um, so time for me, time is the thing that can help you guide you. But one thing that I thought was beautiful was, um, I don't know, you know, sometimes you have people, you see collage presentations and you don't feel their intentionality, but I, I, I didn't see the piece in the show in person, but it just seemed like um, the viewer, even though these are really disparate moments or disparate conversations put together on a wall, it felt very much, you could feel the intention and the, and the connection. And, and it's, it's really, um, it's a real, real achievement, I think, because I've seen the William, I've been up in the archives as well, and I found them to be exciting, but also, you know, just a lot to lasso, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I really wanted to, I did things differently than the archives shows often are, like, I brought a bit of the contemporary art gallery to the space, mm -hmm. you know, the way that I didn't have labels on things, there was just an exhibition map, and that's usually how I present my work, you know, in gallery contexts. Um, but in that too, you know, I had conversations with John where he's like, oh, we usually have labels. We want people to know what the material is, you know. Um, and for me, I, I'm really excited and interested about creating 
those kind of loose tendrils of association. So again, I really wanted to create this like open poetic space that you could sit and walk around. Um, I never, I was meaning to, but I really wanted to put that audio on and walk around the room and see what happens because there's just in each little connection, there's all these things that connect to each other. And I was starting to do that with in terms of, I'm like, okay, this image can sit next to this. They're from different spaces. They start to speak. But even then too, if you're like listening to the sound and you're exploring around and you'll hear that John is talking about something that is maybe then present or picked up in the images or a figure that is present. Like, it's kind of like you have your, your language, your sheets, your info sheet, and then you have your sound and you have your images and just really wanted to like open up this, this poetic space. Something that was also really exciting about that work. And again, I think that I'm hopeful for this project and already has happened a little bit is that folks came and they saw themselves in the photos, like literally, like that is me. That was when I was part of this group. Um, which was super special. And um, like the project has been really emotional. I often think that my queer archive work is like the less emotional work. The project you had mentioned before is like a family history project. It gets, you know, intense. Um, but this one, I was crying a lot. Um, and especially with the Bill Way video where just like feeling the loss and the weight that's also in that space, but also just like the joy, the gratitude, the collectivity, celebration. So it's been a really kind of like rich, interesting, complicated project. I'm gonna read this if it's okay so people yeah. in the recording can know. I saw your film about Bill Way's scrapbook and being, being really moved by your, including the blank pages that remained empty after his passing. I really underscored how abrupt it felt. How far into making that piece did you make that choice? Yeah, so I, I had just had the, all these photos, cell phone photos from Bill Way's scrapbooks. And it was actually a friend of mine, Charmaine Cruz Rivera, who's, um, I know from Chicago, but is in Rotterdam. And she was in town visiting. I was just showing her with her some work that I was um, looking into. And she's like, oh, that could be a film. That feels like your work. And I was like, oh, I hadn't thought about that or a video. Um, and I was, I really was, the blank pages were what really kind of hit home for me as well with that project. So I knew that I wanted to capture those in, in some form and it wouldn't feel the same just to have photos of the blank pages. I don't think you would get the sense that they are repeating. You would, it would just feel like, you know, you're taking the same photo over and over again. So I knew that that moment needed to actually be in film and it needed to be like, a performance. So it kind of actually set the, the tone for the whole work where I said, okay, actually I need to film this. I'm going to film it in a way that feels like I'm just mostly shooting. It's mostly static. Sometimes I'll kind of zoom in or sometimes I'll turn a page. Very few times do you see myself or my hands except for that final performance. And I, I was intentional around that to kind of like the weight of that to sort of hit that there's five minutes of just turning these blank pages. And what do those blank pages mean? Like you said, just like this abruptness um, and what could have happened in that time. Well, it's one o'clock and I want to respect everyone's time. I'm so grateful for everyone who showed up today. Rami, thank you so much. I'm so thankful that I could learn about the show that I missed. <laughs> and thank you, Heather. I don't know if Heather's still in the room, but uh, Heather Raquel uh, told me about it and I was like, oh yeah, no, I want to know more. So I look forward to seeing the park and I look forward to the next conversations, iterations, exhibitions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, inviting me and thanks for everyone that showed up. I'm excited to keep chatting with folks. I got your email port, um, we'll email. Um, and please come out to the park tonight if you're available for the opening, but otherwise it'll be, it'll run through um, August. We just did an interview actually with WHYY, so that'll also get shared soon, um, but I would love for folks to see it. Um, actually, someone who's on this, um, this shirt, who's also present in the park, she was just there yesterday with her daughter. It was incredible. My phone's ringing, so I'm going to yeah. expose myself. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. <laughs> Cheers. Bye-bye.